The first step is to always look at the structure of your alkyl halide. And if you have a secondary alkyl halide, all four of these are possible. It could be SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. Once you look at the structure of your alkyl halide, you then focus in on your nucleophile. Right? So the nucleophile here would be the hydrogen sulfide anion right here. So the negatively charged sulfur is going to function um, as your nucleophile. So let's go ahead and classify our nucleophile as strong or weak. And, and we already know that this is an example of a strong nucleophile, which leads us to think, well, that, that might be a clue that this is an SN2 reaction, since SN2 mechanisms require strong nucleophiles. Is, is hydrogen sulfide anion a strong or a weak base? It is a weak base, because it has a relatively strong conjugate acid. And then finally now, we have to think about the solvent. All right, so we need to classify our solvent here. So we know that DMSO right, is a polar aprotic solvent. Right, so it's polar aprotic, which we know favors an SN2 mechanism since it increases the nucleophilic strength um, of, of your nucleophile. So we have two clues here that tell us this is probably going to be an SN2 reaction. So we're going to draw our product as an SN2 product. And we know we have a chirality center right here. So we have to think about the mechanism of an SN2 reaction. Right, The hydrogen sulfide anion is going to attack uh, this carbon right here from the opposite opposite side of the bromine. Right? So the bromine is going to leave and we're going to add on an SH here and we have inversion of configuration since it was an SN2 mechanism. Let's look at another one here. So let's uh, let's use the same the same starting reactant. All right? So with a chirality center right here like that. And this time we're going to react uh, this molecule with formic acid. Okay, so let's go ahead and write formic acid in here. And that's going to be our solvent and our nucleophile, and we're going to heat up this reaction. Okay, so once again, we need to classify our nucleophile, right? So formic acid can function as a nucleophile because of these lone pairs of electrons on this oxygen, right? But it doesn't have a it doesn't have a full negative formal charge or anything, so it's going to be a pretty weak nucleophile. So we can go ahead and write weak nucleophile here, which which uh, makes me think of SN1. Right away, a possible clue it could be an SN1 reaction. When I think about formic acid as being a base, well, I mean it's an acid, so it couldn't be a very, it could, it could could not be a very strong base at all. So we'll go ahead and write weak base here, and then the solvent, right? Well, in this case, the nucleophile is the solvent, and we know that we can classify all carboxylic acids as being polar protic solvents, right? This is the proton here, so this is a polar protic solvent, which we know favors an SN1 reaction because the polar protic solvent will stabilize the carbocation that would result. So we're going to get a, a secondary carbocation here, and we know that carbocations are flat, so when we think about the stereochemistry of this, when the nucleophilic portion of the molecule attacks, right, we, we could get we could get retention of the configuration. Right, and and we're going to lose a proton in this mechanism. I I won't draw that to save time. And we're also going to get one with inversion of configuration. So I can go ahead and draw that in here with inversion. So both of these are possible, right? And it turns out these two are enantiomers of each other for this reaction. And we 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 knew we got two products because we knew this mechanism proceeded via SN1 by analyzing um, our nucleophile. All right, let's look at let's look at same starting. Same starting material again. Right, so we have our chirality center with our bromine right here. And this time, we're going to react that molecule with sodium ethoxide. So write that, sodium ethoxide, and our solvent will be ethanol, like that. So let's go ahead and see if we can figure out what happens now. So once again, secondary alkyl halide, right? classify our nucleophile. Write the ethoxide anion as our nucleophile here. Right, so it's an alkoxide, so we know that's a strong nucleophile. And again, strong nucleophiles make me think, oh, it's it could be an SN2 mechanism, right? And uh, the sodium 
sodium ethoxide in terms of its basicity, right? It's a, it's a strong base. It wants a proton. So it's a strong base. And something strong that makes me, th if, it's, if it's a strong base, that makes me think of elimination, right? An E2 mechanism with a strong base. And then the solvent, right? So what is the solvent? That's ethanol. So that's a polar protic solvent, right? This would be the, the, the proton right here. So it's a polar protic solvent and that's going to have that's going to have a major effect on the products because if i think about what a polar protic solvent would do it's going to actually solvate the nucleophile so let's go ahead and draw a quick little picture of 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 the nucleophile being solvated so my nucleophile is the ethoxide anion which would look like that right so it has a negative 1 formal charge on it like this and then the solvent comes along right so ethanol Right, so we know that ethanol would look like this. And uh, let's draw a few of those ethanol molecules like that. And we know that the uh, oxygen is partially negative. We know that the hydrogen is partially positive. So we have these partially positive hydrogens, which can interact uh, with that negatively charged oxygen. Right? So there's going to be some interaction here. And, and you can just imagine a whole bunch of solvent molecules around our nucleophile. And when they solvate our nucleophile, they decrease the strength of it. Right? So that negative one formal charge is balanced out by, those, by all those partial positive charges. And so that's decreasing the strength of your nucleus. File. And that means that it decreases the likelihood it's going to react via an SN2 mechanism. So that decreases the likelihood of SN2, which makes E2 the favored, the favored mechanism for this reaction. So now that we know it's E2, we need to look at our alkyl halide, right, and identify the fact that we know this must be, this is our alpha carbon, and we know that this carbon next to it is beta. We'll call this beta 1, we know this one's beta 2. So so we could have uh, we could have the reaction proceed uh, by by the base taking a proton from either the beta one position or the beta two position. So if we think about the beta one position first, right? We covered all this in in some of our earlier videos here, right? We 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 would form an alkene and we could form we could form a transalkene, right? The double bond forms between the alpha and the beta carbon, so we, we could get a trans version, and we could also get a, a cis version, right? So, and we know, we know that the trans version is going to be the major product, right? Trans is more stable than cis. So this is uh, via an E2 mechanism, we're going to get these two products from the beta 1 position, and we can also get a product from the beta 2 position, right? So we can have a double bond form between the alpha and the beta 2 carbon, and so we can draw yet another product, right? We're going to get a product that looks like this. This is also possible. So, so these, uh, let's see, the, the major one would be trans, the minor one would be the cis here, and then you're going to get uh, the beta 2 position. This is, this is also this is going to be very minor. This is only a mono-substituted alkene, right? Not as stable as the di-substituted ones up here. And then, even though we said that there's a decreased chance for SN2, you are going to get a minor product of SN2. So if I think about the ethoxy oxide anion being a strong nucleophile and attacking that chirality center, right? I, I, I am going to get some of this product here where the, where the oxygen portion of our ethoxide anion functions as a nucleophile, attacks our chirality center, and so therefore it's going to be going away from us in space, and there's going to be an oxygen here with an ethyl group on it, right? So, so that, that is also a minor product right here. And if you wanted to increase the percentage of, of this as being your minor product, you could change the solvent, right? So if you change the solvent from a polar protic solvent to a polar aprotic solvent, so if you changed it, right, if you change the solvent to something like DMSO, right, a polar aprotic, uh, that's going to that's going to increase the the, the nucleophilic strength of, of the ethoxide anion, and that's going to increase the amount um, of of your of your SN2 products. That would increase SN2. All right, let's look at one more example. All right, so we've seen we've seen SN2, we've seen SN1, we've seen E2, and then E1 is also possible, although usually not with an alkyl halide. It can happen with an alkyl halide, but it's 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 not really practical. So the the main place you would see an E1 mechanism would be something with like a secondary alcohol. So it's not really even an alkyl halide. So if we started with a secondary alcohol like cyclohexanol and we added an acid catalyst, right, H2SO4, 
we can't even really classify that as being a nucleophile or you know anything like that. So the the trick is just to recognize uh, the mechanism, right? Strong acid, sulfuric acid, will donate protons in solution, right? And uh, so there are protons floating around, and then one of the lone pairs on our oxygen is going to pick up that proton, right? So that makes a good leaving group, right? So OH by itself is 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 not the best leaving group, but once you protonate it. Right to form to form this guy right here with a positive one formal charge on the oxygen. It's an excellent leaving group, and then these electrons in here can kick off onto the oxygen, and then you have a carbocation in your mechanism. And so again, carbocations in your mechanism tell you that it's going to be um, an E1 elimination. And when that water molecule leaves, and uh, the base will take. Um, either water or the conjugate base 2 sulfuric acid takes a proton off that molecule that will form your alkene so this will proceed via an E1 mechanism like that to form cyclohexene as your final product so that's E1 so we've seen we've seen SN2 we've seen SN1 we've seen E2 we've seen E1 uh the, these are kind of hard. The trick again is to to break it down, look at each one of these components, and figure out what is the most likely mechanism based on nucleophilic strength. Is nucleophile a stronger or a weak base? Uh, the solvent, and of course, always remember to start with the structure of your alkyl halide.